Christian, I would also look for the most defensive space. Um, the Airbus, these are the guys with the airplanes. Um, the defensive space is the military that's from um, division and we do cyber security. So, our main focus by now is uh, network forensics and incident response, but we still do Wireshark. Uh, there's a lot of Wireshark actually, and we can it, so we can. Okay. Click. Investigating packet manipulation, um, we had a very interesting case that um, we decided not to break today because it would make some heads explode. Um, we have a certain situation um, where um, at the point that we were hacking at, suddenly um, additional packets were allegedly inserted by some device. Um, we still don't know where it comes from because we weren't allowed to capture on the other side, but um, we can tell from um, analyzing the TCP flow that um, some device in the middle must suddenly create additional acknowledgement packets that had no use at all, but they were somehow created. And um, we are still trying to um, maybe get another capture to do this, but um, sometimes we need a multiple capture just to make sure that the end is okay, the other end is okay, but something in the middle is doing something fine. What's it? Just a quick remark for the second slot, which would be right after a break after this one. We have some live traces. We can hopefully do the analysis together with us. So we have two thumb drives, which I would kindly ask you to pass around for those of you who would like to already get a sneak peek during our call or during the break. Uh, we will do a highly interactive session latest in slot two, so there will be demos here too, which we will do together with you. 
But latest in Slot 2, it's not that we do everything for you, but you have to participate in order to make this work. So please feel free to take a look at that and throw in suggestions in the next slot while I'm starting. Please just pass them around. Just please. Just please. No, no, um, it's not the standard one. We just stole two and copied our stuff over. <laughs> well, I said I borrowed them and the girls were looking at me like, really? Yeah, we don't worry about it. <laughs> So, yeah, we'll bring them back, of course. We'll bring them back at some point, maybe. Okay, and the other thing is... Yeah, congratulations. Uh, asymmetric routing, um, when you have packets going one way and back the other way, and then you need a capture point uh, at both, because you're only seeing one side connection here and one side connection there. And uh, with that, you cannot do much, so asymmetric routing situations you need that as well. Then we have link education. Um, sometimes we had stuff like somebody educating four gigabit links and we need to capture all of them. That is basically basically a merge situation where you need to merge to the stuff happening on those links. And um, then active passive and active, active high redundancy solutions uh, sometimes require this too. But, um, usually, I don't know if you've ever done that, um, inserting a tab in an active passive link. The first time I did it, I put the tab in. And it was, of course, the active link that we disconnected, and then it switched over. I had to type in the data was here. Like, <laughs> I'm not seeing anything. Okay, let's pull it up here and put it in there. And send him, send, send the hand again. I was like, ah, this is not going to work, we need two tabs maybe. Yeah, or you pull it once to, to force it to go back to the tapped one, but uh, that was funny. You learn that the hard way sometimes. In front of the client, is like, do you know what you're doing? <laughs> okay, um, extremely important, and it's underlined as well, so it tells you that we really need that. Um, document everything that you're doing. Um, that is true for any kind of analysis that you do, but let me tell you from experience, if you don't do it in a multi point capture situation where you are handling traces like from the client side in the middle somewhere, from the server side, and you found something here but you document, don't document it. Sometimes an hour later you don't know what you've done. And you're like, I, I found this somewhere, but where was it? And what was it? And you don't know. So um, it's really important to document your findings anyway, but if you do multi point capture, um, it's really, really important. Or I think we said extremely important. So um, don't forget that. And uh, the other thing is to sync the time of your capture devices. Um, they're not going to be exactly perfect because it cannot sync down to the nanosecond, um, unless maybe you have some fancy GPS time source thingy. Um, but um, just keep them almost in the same minute per second at least, or a second would be better, and it's still too much data. Um, so that if you're looking at Stuff like, hey, I found some, something at that time, and we're talking to each other, like, try to find it in yours, and his is like five minutes off, and this will get us into trouble. So um, the time should be almost the same. Okay, compare trace lines. It takes a lot of time, of course, because you need to look at the one and the other, and uh, it's it's often um, one of the first things that you do is to identify the same packets at the other location. So um, finding the packets that you have on one side and finding them on the other side can be um, complicated. We will have a couple, a couple of uh, examples for you um, where we'll try to do that live and probably we're going to uh, run into the same problems that everybody has every once in a while when we're doing that because sometimes we will have something on the one side that the other side doesn't have yet because the capture will start later especially if you're doing that alone and then you start and capture here then you run to the other side, start to capture there something important happens here but we don't have it over the end, over there yeah, so um, that can happen as well so what we need to do is find the same packets, isolate the conversations, match them, and then determine latency, packet loss, all of that stuff that we are looking for. And um, you can do it automatically in some situations, if you with uh, pilots, or it's called now uh, something... Packet Headlines. Yeah, Packet Headlines, uh, which is like a uh, name nobody likes, I think. Nobody I talk to, at least. Um, so let's say it's pilot, and uh, give Google that some problem. Find identities, BNP conversations, that should be simple for you because this is a three-fit talk, you all know how to do that, right? 
Who doesn't know how to find a TCP conversation, how to isolate it? Really? That is, uh, okay. Um, basically, what you're looking for is source ID, source port, destination ID, destination port, and if it's TCP, UDP, or something funky. Okay? If you have those five values, or five tools, um, then it's the same connection. Unless you have port views, but not to talk about port views right now. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're looking for the same socket combination, socket with port, uh, an ID and a port, two sockets, source and destination, um, and the same protocol TCP or UDP, that would mean we have the same thing on both ends. What if we have not? If we don't, well, um, or if we have net, net, network address translation. What happens with network address translation? Stuff changes, right? Makes things more complicated. Um, it can mean that you're looking at other things to find the same conversation again. Um, that can be problematic, especially if somebody's really, really into security and, and paranoid, because if they start changing also sequence numbers and IP IDs and whatever, then you will have trouble finding the stuff again. Um, then you need to compare the content, maybe. Um, find the same URL as being called. If it's unencrypted, if it's encrypted, you need to look for like SSL certificates being the same. Um, stuff like that. You need to find anything where you can say, I think this one on the inside is the same as the outside. And that is one of the problems that we have. There's others that can get us into trouble. Like proxies and um, I think we have a slide about those. We also have port address for the rest of the station, yeah, that too. Um, there's a lot of things that can change in the middle of the, of the path. So we need to um, find something that we can match, basically. So for other protocols, we have ARP, ICMP, DHCP, and generic stuff. Um, we have a couple of ideas here. You could use the MAC addresses. Um, ARP should not travel across routers anyway, so um, if you're looking for two capture uh, points in the same segment, uh, then you should be able to match those. Uh, for SMP, it's type code, ping sequence, packet code, um, anything that you can find that is the same way you can say this is the same on both ends, but not in any other packet. Or not in any other packet at roughly the same, same time frame. Okay, it may be the same for another packet, but minutes later and you're sure that the time is quite correct. So that would be okay. Alright, um, if it's generic IP and you don't have anything else, the last thing that you could do is IP ID and TTL. Um, TTL only if it's not across the router, because then it's one less. Uh, maybe that even works, but uh, it gets more complicated. So um, let's just say um, tracking TCP and UDP connection is much simpler than all the other stuff. Especially TCP, because in TCP you have even sequence numbers and um, that is really helpful if it's not modified by any device. If it's modified by any device, um, that can be basically, from my experience, the device calling in the trouble. Um, devices that mess around with sequence numbers very often get it wrong in some locations, um, especially in uh, stack uh, blocks. Sometimes they forget that a TCP option can have a sequence number in there. And um, then you can, well, then you can find that there is the old sequence number not modified in the sec block, but the other thing in the TCP header is modified. So um, if they don't match, they are suddenly like millions apart. Um, that could be a problem. We also have devices that simply zero out the sec blocks or the sec ranges. Um, this is the so-called four knot problem. If you see four knot operations in the TCP header. Um, in the options uh, that could be that the device is trying to uh, wipe the sec option, and uh, that is a good indication that somebody is running a device that is not um, living in 2017. Okay, so that is quite 2005 maybe. All right, um, conversation filters. Um, here's an example: um, IP address and port, and IP address and port. Basically, since Wireshark is looking at all the fields, and uh, you can use AND for all of them, you could also um, um, turn them around, of course, um, or put the port in the other uh, brackets, but uh, sometimes it's good just to keep them together, so you um, keep the sockets uh, visible in the same way. 
Then, if you have isolated it, um, I think everybody knows this trick to um, export specified packets, which allows you to save only the packets that you're seeing right now into a new file. Um, this may sound not that important, but if you're dealing with a couple of gigabytes or even terabytes of data and uh, extracting one single conversation from that, um, you can work with the extracted thing much faster than uh, running full as on the full file all the time. So um, we do that a lot. We often just pull the interesting stuff from the, the big files and um, save them. But I have to admit that we rarely do it in Wireshark if we have that much data because it's much easier to do that with T Shark. Uh, just let T Shark run over the set of files that you have and pull in all the packets, then let it pull all the packets and write them to new files and merge them. That is usually the fastest way. So, if possible, isolate the initial SIM packets. Why the SIM packet? Why, what's so good about the SIM packet? It's what? It's where the handshake starts, so it's the first sequence number that we have, and if we find a SIM packet with the exact, exact same sequence number, maybe it was the same IP address, so we're not looking at that and uh, any kind of conversation, we can be pretty sure that this is the exact conversation we're having. The same one on both sides that we're comparing. So we, we very often look for ID, port, ID, port, TCP, of course, and then the sequence number of the SIM. If we have that, we are pretty sure this is the exact same thing. Okay? So, um, if you're wondering what this uh, filter is, tcp.flex equals 2, what does that mean? It means that the flex bytes, where all the flex are in there, like SIM, ACK, FIN, PUSH, whatever, is, has, it has the number, or has the value of 2, and that means that only one flag is set, and number two, and that is the sim flag. So if you're filtering for tcp.flex.sim equals equals one and not tcp.flex.act equals equals one to find only sims, um, that is a filter that long. And we're lazy, so we just write tcp.flex equals two, and we know it's, it's a sim, not a sim act. Uh, and it's much, much faster to type this. As soon as you remember that one, it's like, done. And everybody who doesn't know what that is, is like, well, what are you filtering? Or what is flag number two? It's a sim flag, okay? All right, um, and best practice, deactivate relative TCP sequence numbers. What is the relative TCP sequence number? Zero. <laughs> Zero, that's kind of um, Let's just say it this way, if you have relative sequence numbers, Wireshark will take the initial sequence number in the SIM, or the first one that it finds, if you don't have the SIM in the trace, it will take the first one that it finds for the conversation, and reduce every following sequence number by that number. So basically reduce the first one to zero, because it's subtracting itself from itself, and when it gets increased, every increased number is still reduced by the initial sequence number, so you start with the um, sequence number that seems to be starting at zero, while in truth, the sequence number is a 30 bit number and it's usually really huge, right? Um, relative sequence number can get you into trouble because they're relative to something that you may not have in one trace, but it's something other in the other trace, and then you can't find them anymore. Um, when Christian and I were um, trying some of our traces um, a couple of days ago, we were trying to find sequence number for the SIM, and I couldn't find them unless, um, until he said, well, um, do you still have relative sequence numbers on? And I was, ah, yes, of course, I had them on. They were reduced to zero at the beginning, so I couldn't find them. So we need to turn them off. Okay, everybody is here? Yeah? What kind of... Some Determining latency. How do you determine latency? Um, well, basically, um, if you have a connection from one side to the other, and this is the time column, or the time running, the packet travels back, and the answer comes in return. And now you can basically try to find the time at all the locations by maybe capturing in front of each device. Yeah, so in that way, if I capture in front of router 1 and directly after router 1, or behind router 1, 
I could try to determine how long it takes for a package to go through that device. Who is an alumni trying to determine how long a package needs to uh, uh, stored in the device or needs to travel? Uh, uh, maybe a handful. Okay. Um, so, how you do that is like this. You do two captures, one in front of the device, the other one on the other side. You see the request packet going in, you see the answer going back, and then what you take is the distance between seeing the first packet here and the answer there, that is your capture spot delta 1. Then you do the same, same thing on the other side, which is smaller as you can see. And if you subtract this one from that one, that's the time it takes for both packets to travel through, and then you can basically say half of that is the delay of that device. Okay? And the good thing about this approach is you don't need synchronized clocks and very exact timings and nanosecond resolution, whatever, it doesn't matter because what you're having is the delta time on this side, and it's only the clock on this side, so only the time distance between the two packets are the one left to the other side. And the same thing over here. So once again, you're calculating the distance here, and then subtract them, divide by two, and you have the time that it takes to get a packet through that device. And sometimes you will find whole devices that are really slow, and they take milliseconds sometimes, and then they have, to, and then they have really fast devices to take microseconds, sometimes nanoseconds, um, depending on what it is. Yeah, so that is one of the techniques that we use to um, isolate really, really slow devices to um, just see how long does it take for a packet to go through. Basically, it's two packets, a request and a response. You need to be able to match those, of course. But if you see a GET request and the ACT for the GET request, then you know these two are perfect. Let's just calculate the distance here, the distance there, time distance, subtract, divide by two, and you have the delay of the device. Okay? Um, if that's too complex right now and you're still asleep because it's early in the morning, um, I've written about this in my blog as well, so um, you can read it up if you want to. I'm pretty sure I wrote a blog post because yesterday I was talking to somebody and I said, well, I wrote a blog post of the, about this one. Um, I wrote one about this one too, and this one too, and this one too, so probably it's in there somewhere. <laughs> All right, so I'm bored of Christian, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> Net proxy localizers. Um, localizers. Um, one of my eternal enemies, probably, or if you're doing network analysis, no localizers are here. Very often, something where you say, well, in your problem scenario, there's this small device like a PC and a switch and another switch and a localizer and another switch and a server. The localizer, that's interesting. Let's check that one. Um, because out of experience, um, more often than not, the local lens is doing something that it shouldn't do, and it is a problem. So if I see local lens, or even worse, the packet shaper, or fancy um, prioritization, prioritization devices, um, most often than not, those are the ones doing something um, that is delaying stuff. Um, not because the device itself is faulty, but because somebody configured something that doesn't make any kind of sense. Uh, because these things are sometimes a bit complex. Um, localizer, what they do, um, is quite simple. You send a request to the localizer. The localizer has some kind of algorithm or idea um, which of the three web servers is currently the least busy, so it should be the fastest. And it will send the request to the, uh, to the web server, then gets the answer back and sends me the result. So localizers are basically there to scale applications. Okay? Um, that can mean that if we're doing multiple point analysis, we need to capture at the client, at the local and the front to make sure that the switch isn't doing something funny, and then maybe on the other side of the local lenser and maybe again on each of the web servers. So um, sometimes you um, have to do a lot of capture points um, to get everything at the same time. If you don't have that many capture devices, you need to think about, well, what would be the best um, capture spots. Let's say you have two capture points that you can build or insert with the devices you have. So what would you capture? Front and back of the load dock. Front and back of the load dock. So here and there. So I can 
see whether it's left or right to find the problem. Yeah, that could be possible. Um, other uh, designs could be, hey, I need the client because getting as close to the client as possible is a good thing. And then maybe on the other side of the local answer. Yeah, then you can take a good guess about uh, how fast does the thing um, come through the local lesser when it's sent from the client. Um, a lot of other situations or setups are good too. Um, well, what I wouldn't do is like do two capture points, one here and one there. That would be stupid because um, I capture only two of the three servers and nothing on the client, nothing on the local answer really. So um, better to get something at the client and maybe here on the local answer. That would be what I would start with. What do we do with the local answer? We usually create a new connection between local answer and the backend. Yeah. Uh, most of them they will not exactly log the the mapping between them. So how how do you find it? Um, so, so the question is. Find it easy more. So the local lenses uh, don't lock the connection that they establish when you uh, get a connection from the client, then they do a new one on their own. And the question was, how do you check that because they don't lock what they're doing? Yeah, you have thousands of connections, yeah. how do you know which specific client matches a specific server type? That is, it, that is exactly why we're here, because we're going to show you. Okay, um, you try to match the ones coming out of the local lens and try to find the one that was caused by the original connection. Very often they are pretty close in time, sometimes they are not, but that is what we are going to show you how to do. Okay? Now things can even get nastier when they multiplex within a single already open connection, right? So you have an incoming connection which is pretty easy to find and to determine, and then you take a look on the other side and you just have this duration of a TCP session where everything is somewhere inside. So of course it can get more and more difficult. Proxies do that a lot too, yeah. because they open new connections for you. And uh, sometimes they really put everything in one single connection because it's to an upstream proxy, and then good luck. Yeah, um, you need to find the stuff in one single connection. Uh, it's quite quite possible. Okay, network request translation. I think we covered that already. Um, it's usually relevant up to layer three, which means uh, router. So um, what we have is source and destination, and which means uh, sometimes the one port is changed, sometimes the other. Um, the IP addresses are usually changed from the um, client device going to the internet or something. Um, basically, you need to find out what your net device is doing and then try to find the connection on the other side by um, basically comparing things like maybe the sequence number. Um, very often, um, net devices do not mess with the sequence number, so um, that is something that we often use. Um, it's, it's a good thing because the sequence number is 32-bit random, and if you do a search for a random sequence number, um, initial one, uh, on the SIM package, it's quite rare that you find two SIMs with the same initial sequence number. It never happened to me. So if the network is not changing those, um, searching for that is a good thing to find the connection no matter what they did to it. Of course, if they are changing the sequence number, that is maybe the trouble that you have in your network because that often doesn't work that well. Okay, now we have process servers. Um, we just put in the, the pictures here to give you an idea how a setup like that could work. Um, because when we are looking at the try side later, we will have this kind of setup in some of them. Um, basically, a client will talk to a proxy. That is one TCP connection between the two. And if I ask the proxy something that it should fetch me uh, from the internet, this one will open a new connection going out to the internet. So, um, if you're if the proxy has been talking to the uh, server on the internet already for someone else, maybe somebody reading a CNN.com website or something, uh, the proxy may have already have an open connection to the destination and the new request gets put into the same TCP connection. So that is what Christian said, that we sometimes need to find a new connection that is part of an already existing connection. Then you don't have a SIM because uh, since this one has a SIM with a sequence number to the proxy, but this one opens a completely new session. You can't match the sequence number of the SIM anymore because it's two different things. It's not the same connection. It's a new one. So um, when you do that, um, you need to find other things. Uh, what we often do is try to find get requests that are identical in parameters um, or um, they go to the same server right after the original connection requested that server. And sometimes it's just a time distance thing that you can do. <coughs> Alright, 
right? Um, then there's some proxies that address at the address of the um, client in the outbound request. So the X forward for will tell me what client ID requested this one. Um, I don't know if you have seen this one. Um, I will be turning off on my proxies um, because I don't want my internal IP exposed on the internet. So very often you won't find this one, but um, maybe it's a good idea to turn it on for the duration of the uh, analysis that you're doing, so you have an idea which client did the request. Yeah, so the exported forward for the help of you, so to speak, that the proxy inserts into the outbound to the connection to tell you this is for client whatever. And sometimes that is even used for firewalling, um, that some things are allowed through the firewall, some, some aren't, so firewall sometimes work on that field. So you may have it. Um, if you don't have it, um, you have to use something else. Okay. Um, then, what was that side about? Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I remember. We, we wrote out some of those slides a while ago. So, um, the trace method, I don't know if you've used it. Um, trace method basically means that I send a request to a web server and tell them, uh, or tell it like, please send me back the headers that you received from me. So it's like an echo that I get back. And um, the trace method is quite nice to find proxies that you aren't aware of. Because if your request is modified on the way to the web server, and the web server sends me back as a web page the request that it got, then I can see if something modified my request on the way, because transparent proxies sometimes will do that. If there's a transparent proxy in the way, um, you will not be able to find it otherwise. So just send a trace request to a web server that supports it, most don't, and what you get back will be an echo of the request that arrived at the web server. So if some device in the middle changed it, you can tell. I think that uh, I use um, Fiddler for this. I don't know if you know Fiddler. Fiddler is a free Windows tool um, that you can use to forge web requests. And that is quite nice for that. Here, the X404, for example, is unknown. So um, there was no X404 sent in this request. But um, just by seeing the X404, I know that there was a proxy. Because I, my client didn't send an X404, but it's in the reply that I get back from the server, so um, that's a nice thing to find that there's a proxy. And I think that was it, uh, that was it. Uh, no more slides, so we can wake up now. Um, and let's do some actual work. Are you sure you're finished? Um, What's some more more stories and stuff? Or? I don't know. Oh, not okay. only Q&A. So, um, I'm done. Good. <laughs> Finally. The word so, was maybe in between, I don't know. They come up, then they go. Do you want this thing? Yeah, sure, you can have the station. Mm -hmm. something else I can try. Oh, okay. Uh, this, is it working? Testing? Yeah. Whatever. Uh, they're kind of big, that's why we decided not to upload them yet, because the Wi-Fi yeah. wasn't that performant here, so... They're pretty big. We can check later. Okay. So... I, I can prepare a download for you afterwards, so just watch us do it, and then you can do the same thing later. Okay. And since Angelo is also recording this session, you can have the video and the traces later at home. Probably that's better. Okay. okay. Hey, could you reopen the slide with the uh, low answers and all this stuff? Oh my god, where's the slides? Oh my god, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I think we need to adapt the resolution. Something changed. Who can read this? Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. Hey, I have to work with yeah, no. VGA would, stuff here. It wouldn't be fair. It's unfair. It wouldn't Come on. Be fair. 
So if what we have on the slide with the load transfers and the proxy and everything, what again? You gotta move your microphone. Yeah, you can put it closer. Put it closer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. says, yeah, well, we're having people complaining about slow web applications. I mean, that's usually the case in nowadays. Everything is based on web applications, and some of them are slow, some lose connectivity. So this is kind of a classic thing where 90% of our engagements start with. So for this pre one, um, we had a small task assigned in the background story, which was like, OK, there is a company, and people from all over the smaller offices who get routed to the central uh, data center, they, some of them use Outlook, some of them use other web clients, but there's an issue with the so-called web mailing web application. So I'm sure you know that, like OWA. So many of those customer slides were using a web front end to log into their email system, the corporate email system, check the mails. And the issue was that they said, well, we have some people behind the firewall and some behind this one, that one. And just for some people, it's always very slow, but we can't really determine it, and then we have the usual uh, the usual statements, like we think it's on lunchtime. And at lunchtime, sometimes it's slow, and you know, always when here, we hear that, we say, okay, let's take a look at the traces first, because there's always myths and rumors what people think is happening, so let's get down to the client trace and see if there's a problem at all. So from what we know, it's obviously a problem while accessing a website which has something to do with some kind of webmail. So how would you proceed if you have no idea, if you don't get IP address, if you don't get URLs, no host names, no ever, but hey, here's the trace on the client machine. What do you do to spot whether there is at all some web-based webmail connection in there or whatever? On what? HTTP, we can do that. So there we go. So now we're down to 82,600 packets. Does this help? It's only 40%. It's only 40%, so we already got rid of 60. So what are the delta time of response? So for delta time. So? Here? Okay, so we click there. Oh, good. So who is the sorted delta time? I assure you mean the big ones, right? And now? Find the first sin. Of what? This conversation. Which one? This one? Uh, whichever you're on the side. 
your conversation? What about putting the HTTP request time as a column? I respond. If you go down into HTTP, yeah, can okay, do that. And the time sense request, right click on time sense request, yeah. apply it as a column, and then sort on that. Let's do this. Let's find it on this resolution. There we go. Move that to the front. I love that. Resolution. Sorry for that. So, sorry for times as request. Wait for it hopefully to happen. And my scroll bar is going again. <laughs> oh, there it is. So we have two or three different approaches. Just look at the yellow times, slightly better. Take a look at HTTP response times because they know there are already dimensions who have a pretty high time between the HTTP response and the corresponding request. So now here you have a few return codes where you say, okay, it's, this is probably with seven seconds and so on, this, this might be pretty high. So how can we check where this connection was going to? What do we do? If we have one pack where we say, okay, this might be something problematic. What do we do always as the next step? We go single packet. How? Oh, okay. No, who, who said follow to the street? <laughs> Leave the room, please. <laughs> <laughs> because you open this extra window that you always close, right? Don't do it. Use conversation filters. Much better. You kind of do the same thing when you right click and just conversation filter TCP, which will follow, kind of follow the stream, but won't extract the data and put it together. Uh, who knows why for all TCP stream might be an issue? What's it? Can you repeat why you do not want to just do all, all uh, uh, the streams? That's exactly the question. Why, why is it sometimes a problem to use for all TCP stream? It's big. It's slow. Yeah, no, it's, it's, not fa it's not really faster or slower to go for the conversation filter, but there's a separate window. You have content extraction, and when I'm talking, you have content extraction. And think of security related stuff. What might happen? You might see something. You might see something. Exactly. <coughs> yes. You can, but that's a very good point. So imagine you're sitting on a customer place and you're troubleshooting some email based issue. And you just go on a TCP stream and you see the mail from a whatever, from the CEO to his not wife, stating, hey, thank you for last night or something. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, might be into trouble. And there's no legitimate reason, I'm not even it, I'm serious. There's no legitimate reason why for traffic analyzing purposes, without content analysis in background, you go for fraud. Because you will see content that you're not supposed to see and that you don't need to see for performance analysis. When you go for content analysis, Totally different story, of course, and we have to follow the HTTP stream and the TCP stream. So, you know, at some companies there's this uh, data sensitivity guy or whatever, so if, if they are standing right behind you while you do this and they see windows popping up and you see sensitive content, they might immediately throw you off and say, okay, you've got it. Second reason is, um, security-wise, in terms of when you're uh, looking for infected systems, and you say, okay, I think I have a client who's infected with some kind of malware, and I think this is the connection being done to the malware to control this PC. Um, when you have malicious code being transmitted, and you follow that TCP stream, the part of the malicious code will be taken out of the packets, reassembled, written to disk, and whatever security system is there on your local machine, in most cases the antivirus, will fire off and tell you, hey, there's something malicious going on here which again may not be what you want because number one, T-Shock will give you, uh, Wireshark will give you an error saying, sorry, I couldn't open the TCP stream, guess why? AV threw it away already. 
And number two, if you're using a corporate provided machine to do that, uh, you get a call from the security guys and tell you, whoa, there's some infection in your machine. Why are you analyzing stuff? What did you do? So better be careful with that. Long story short, we do the same thing, but we use conversation filter TCP. And there we go. So we go way to the top. Here's the SID. I have an issue because here we still filter for time since request. So just to make sure, I go for the frame number again. Wait until it's done again. There we go. So where's our problematic packet? That one? Time says request, 7.2 seconds. So here's the request. So it looks like what made it? This is a crappy web server, which of course we put in there on purpose to distract you. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're sometimes evil. Would be too easy otherwise. Yeah, it would be too easy. But the procedure is pretty straightforward. It was a pretty good idea. So we just missed one step. We need to get an overview of the situation of what is this client doing through HTTP at all. So there are various ways to do that. And one of them is just to go for the statistics, HTTP request, uh, sorry, not that one. Misclicked the requests. So as you can see down there, he's busy, busy, busy loading all the information. So this might take a while. And when he's done, I have to close all these things again. So, ah, okay, we have to wait until he's finished. So what we're having here is basically a list of all the different GET requests we're seeing. Uh, we can also do that with a T-shirt alternative, which could be pretty fast in comparison while he's doing that. So let's tr give it a try. We go for the client one. We extract all the HTTP requests. Not HTTPS. Check if it's working. It looks good. And extract HTTP host, for example. Let's check that. What do we have? Yeah, might look pretty good. So in addition, we might extract the http.request.uri. Yeah, looks pretty good. Throw it in the text file, HTTP requests. There you go. Let him run. In the meantime, this one's finished. So. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. where were you just then? Uh, my command line. Okay. Sorry. And so, this is obviously everything web based on Facebook, some Google, some German newspaper site. Here are web servers, something, a static images. Here's something kind of dynamic. Let's keep that in mind, maybe for later. Another web server, maybe what's this doing? So, we see search files image, event, whatever. Also, it doesn't look pretty much like webmail, so we keep, skip that. Web server 1, style CSS, robots.txt, some CGI bin with a nice user and password in plain text there. Maybe we keep that for later fun issues. Let's see. Again, website, Twitter, newspaper, Facebook, you know. So, i got to speed this up a little. So, there we are. There's one thing which should jump to your eyes immediately. Something called load balancer. And like Jasper said, when we find something like previous proxy load balancer, it's always, okay, we might take a look at that guy. And we scroll, from, uh, scroll down through the URLs, you see here suddenly a string mail turns up, again with some images being loaded, okay. And when I go for website analysis and timing issues, I, I'd rather skip the static content and go for the dynamic one because there's rarely a situation where getting a picture takes long due to some critical error. Uh, if it, that would be the case, that static content takes ages to download, it would normally be everyone's affected with it because that's what everybody's realizing. So most of the not easy to reproduce problems come through dynamic requests and content generating stuff. So we're searching for something which looks more dynamic and here's a big block of actions where we see 
this definitely is some syntax which triggers action on the web server because we're setting parameters, we're giving actions, we're giving it tasks, etc., etc. So that looks more promising. So next thing we do is we look for common identifiers. So some identifier a string or some characters which all of those requests have in common. And so the very first one you see is everything starts with a parameter task and it says task equals mail. So let's get every request out there which comes with a task equals mail and check for the response times. How do we do that? Contents, right. Let me go to PowerShell. So, where we, where we are. So again, we go read the file. We filter for the HTTP dot requests. And we say HTTP request URI contains task and HTTP request URI contains mail, right? So you want to see the HTTP request where there's a task inside and a mail string inside. Check if that works. Seems pretty good, right? So we all, all we have those get request what we're seeing here. So how to get the corresponding responses to know how long it took? Is there an easy filter we can do it? Like please, dear Mr. Wireshark or Mr. T-shirt, give me the response to that thing. Unfortunately not, because we don't have contextual-based filtering abilities, because we don't have states in Wireshark. But what we can do is we can get an identifier for all those TCP connections where our traffic uh, pattern matches, which is usually the five type of Jasper was talking about, but since we're having a single trace file here, we can be a little lazy and say the TCP stream index will suffice. Stream index is unique TCP identification number for every single trace. So that's what we're doing. So we go for T-field again. And say, please give me TCP stream. There we go. So next thing we're going to do is build a filter and say, okay, I want to have all those different TCP streams filtered out of the trace file because then we know whatever there is in the trace. Number one advantage, it's the full TCP conversations, so we have everything we need to analyze it. And number two, it's only TCP conversations going to webmail or to the URI, which we suppose is webmail. So there's various ways to do that. I'm a little lazy, so I try to do it with PowerShell with a join command, see if that works or tcp.stream equals equals. Or the safe bet, you just copy it, paste it to your favorite text editing application, and then go and replace all the new lines with equals equals or tcp stream, which will also build you a one-click filter, kind of. So this is our filter. And in the meantime, PowerShell is finished, so there's just two ways to do it. Or you use a Python script or Perl, whatever. So whatever suits the case. So now we're having that, and we go right through the client trace and have them get all those conversations. Let's see how much we got left. Dissecting. So it's down to 250 packets out of the 204,000 trace file. That's kind of nice. So before we start filtering more, I take those 250 bytes and say client to possible web mail URI. Save that. And now I can just work through it much faster because I don't have to wait like 10 to 15 seconds for this stuff to happen. So, here we are. Let's take the very first request, colorize the conversation, 
make you familiar with it. You see, all this is all one TCP conversation. We're pretty good to go. So default thing to check. This is driving me crazy. The resolution. So. One thing I always do, I put a time reference on the SYN package to check round trip times. What do we have here? It's, damn that, that's, let's keep scrolling away all the time. So, we have a pretty fast round trip time since we're local, so we check that. And time reference on the request, network based acknowledgement within a millisecond, and we see, okay, 0.437 seconds until it comes back with an answer. Is that long? Close to half a second. It's not good at all. So, number one. Next thing. Here is another one. Let's go for that. Figure that out. Do the same thing. Time reference. Get request. Here's eight seconds. That's definitely too long. Right? So, remove the colors. Let's take this long guy here. Colorizer, slightly red, remove the filter, and we're seeing this traffic in between. So we don't know for what reason, but obviously there is an issue. So now we know it's on the client. The client waits until the answer from this 10301 guy, which is supposed to be the proxy. So for you to remember 10.3, that's the proxy guy. Whatever is the client. So now we move to the second capture point, which Jasper will do. And our main task is to find that very specific connection on the uplink towards the data center. Hopefully having an identifier where we can manage to find that. And hopefully read Jasper's font size. I can zoom. So yeah, do that. Let's go for the first one. No, I don't want to rename it. Okay, loading. I just filter back for that one so it's more easy to follow. Okay, what do I need? What do I need to find? Up to you. So we have an IP pair, so we have 10301, which should be in your trace. Do you have 10301 in your trace? That's just fine. Are you using any resolution? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It works. So, 10, so for 10, 3, 0, 1. 0, 1. Yeah. And I had a funny eye here, I think. Yeah. Go away. Yeah, I think I do. Looks like I do. Who is it? Is it proxy? It's proxy, yeah. So what you're seeing here as proxy dog whatever is 10301 on my client trace. I can turn off name resolution. I don't care. You can leave it on. Maybe it's easier to follow. Let's have both parents. Okay. So. So I am having a specific connection here with sequence number 1043 whatever. Let's try to find it. Yeah, go. Sequence. TCP sequence equals equals one zero four three one three four two nine nine. I think I found it. You got it? Yeah. Good. It's this one. So let's compare it. I colorize it? No, just follow the conversation directly. Okay, follow it. Gotta make a sort of speed. There it is. There we go. Hmm. That looks strange. What's happening there? That's friends. One way. One, One way. way connection. Did we do something wrong in filtering? Okay. 
So we see the one-sided connection. The user of one filter, we use conversation filter TCP, so it works. Um, that's what we did. We didn't type it on our own. So that's something which can happen when you're doing traces, right? Either we did the capture setup wrong, we don't really know. Is there another option why we just see it? Only one side of the trace? Isometric routing. Perfect. Which is exactly what we built in there. So for this particular connection, we had an isometric routing situation. Hopefully it doesn't turn out to be like that all the time. So we have to find another connection, right? So go back. Good that we filtered this one down. So it should work pretty fast. So we don't use this. Let's take the next one. There we go. So sequence number one zero four two seven four four two seven four two five four two five four two. There it is. You have that? Good. Let's hope that's better. Are we on purpose showing you all the issues we are having? We're building the trace file since this is exactly what you will encounter the first time you just get stuff from multiple capture points. You don't know what's happening in there. And in most cases, when a client is having a problem or a customer is having a problem, you also find lots of side problems, which may not be the reason why you're there, but like stuff with asymmetric routing or differences from infrastructure diagrams where stuff is supposed to go through, but when you have the trace, you know it's not. It's going some, somewhere completely different. That's just what happens. So does this look better? It does. Good. Yeah, good. So are we having the same conversation? 1031, who is he talking to? No, there's some other guy coming in. So I'm having 192 as a source address and you're 102117. So maybe we're in that it. Looks like that. I have source port 52300. I have 32909. So obviously we're having a situation where we have a different IP and we have a different port number. Now, like I said, for now we rely on the sequence number to be the identifying factor to match those two conversations, even though we have a different source IP and different source port, which might be due to NAT, might be due to a firewall doing crazy stuff or whatever. So we're pretty sure this should be the same. We could double check by taking a look at the time. So if it's roughly the same time, we should be fine. So mine is on 18 o'clock, 10 minutes, 45 seconds. Yeah. You're what, almost 10 seconds late? Yeah. yeah, that should somehow be the same thing. Slight issues, not exactly the timing on the captures. We could compare like yeah. uh, get requests. We could. So what's the time delta between your get request and the 200 OK? Is it also slow? Yeah. I have 7.7 .7 seconds. 7.7 .7 seconds. So fair enough. So we expect it to be that situation we're looking at. We're just being 99.29 secure, uh, sure that it is, but it will surface, will work. So, question? I, just, we some, I sometimes, when we're in this situation, use ITID as well. A lot, most devices I see uh, preserve that across as well. Oh, we can check for the SIM packet. Five one six nine six. There you go. Good. All right, so this looks like it's the same, right? <clears throat> we have the delay here. We have the delay here, so it's not the client side. It must be somewhere further down the road, okay? So, what do we do now? We need to find out why the delay is there. How do we do that? Yeah, but first... Maybe let's take a look at what is happening between the request and the reply, right? Yeah. So, so I'm out. I'm just fine. I don't. I just only see my connection. I have no idea what the proxy is doing or whatever. I'm, I'm out. So what I what I often do is colorize it because then all the packets for that connection are colorized or easy to spot, so to see, uh, so to say. And now just well. Click on maybe the get request. Some you can even mark the two. That's what I often do. Mark the two that are my good point and bad point because here it's still okay. There it takes forever. 
and now maybe just clear the filter. The good thing about marking it, you can jump to marks, so if you get lost in the trace, which I often do in a situation like that, just jump to the previous mark and you're back at where you started. So that is a good thing to remember. Like just now, I think it's uh, somewhere else. Let's see. It's still loading. Still loading? Oh, okay. My machine is so slow. Oh, there it is. All right, so sin, synac, get, ack. So that is the get request. That is the ack for the get request. That doesn't count because I don't get any kind of content back. There's a lot of stuff going on. I need to find the other thing. How long do I have to scroll? Eight seconds. Eight seconds. So you want to do seconds. that? Yeah. Do I want to scroll for eight seconds? No. no. Because it's not real time, right? It means I have to scroll a lot. Unbelievable amounts of, of packets. So let's not do that. Let's go back up. I could jump to it. So are my columns sorted correctly? Yes. So. The question is, what happens after the GET request and the ACK comes in, which means that the next guy has gotten my GET, re get request, he acknowledges that he got the GET request. He got no. the GET request. Huh? Got the GET request. He got the GET request. <laughs> Confusing. Um, so now the question is, do we see anything happening after that? So the next... This system, the proxy or whatever it is, got the GET request, and what it is doing? Is it doing now? Is there anything that we can say? Okay, this is triggered by the GET request. Louder, please. Do what? I heard something about archive. Yeah. Um, the archive doesn't interest us. It's just there to confuse you. <laughs> yeah, sometimes in a situation like this you need to talk to people to find out hey this system what does it do is it relevant and they tell you no it's not the thing is that's exactly the situation where the difficulty lies in so you're seeing something and you want to know what happens next but there's loads of traffic going through in like the seven seconds so there must be something where you can precisely look for so we asked, we asked the proxy to do something for us. So obviously, one of the next steps is to take a look, what does the proxy do? Who is the proxy talking to? Is he maybe opening a new connection? Or is he just sending a data packet and do the, kind of the same thing we did on the client, try to match it? Does it make reasonable sense that this is what we're looking at? So what are we looking at? That's kind of easy, right? There's new sin from the proxy, kind of straight afterwards. So maybe we're lucky and this is it. And not only is there a new sim, but if you take a get request that follows a couple of packets later, this looks pretty much like the same kind of get request that we already sent to the guy, right? Yeah, don't be too sure. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But it looks like it. I mean, I'm often just trying things out if I do this. So maybe this is it, maybe it isn't. If it isn't, I will learn something from it. So um, the, the, what's it called? Occam's razor uh, would mean Let's just go for it and see if, it is, if this is what I need. So, could just go in here and maybe colorize it. I could also filter on it, but I don't want to do that. Why not? You lose the other part. Because I lose everything else, and what I want to see is basically this. I see the get request, I see the slow response, and I want to know what happens in between, right? So. What do I expect to see from this yellow connection? It starts after the GET request. Where, where should it end? Right before the response. Right here, right? So if I keep everything colorized that I'm interested in, I can just now try to see if the color of the yellow conversation ends as soon, right before um, the, the um, answer of the other thing, right? So, we used to have an interesting thing in Wireshark that allowed us to jump through conversations. Uh, I don't think it's working here, but we can try. So, let me click on this one and I do a control. What was it? Dot? Yeah, go to Go menu. Check if it out. Go to what? Go to the Go menu. Go menu. You know this? Go to previous and next back in the conversation. 
This is an awesome feature for exactly that situation we're having, where we like thousands of packets, and we don't like to scroll and find the one yellow thing in there, but you just want to hit the button, and there you go with the next packet. So let's check if it works. Yellow situation, and you end up... Well, let's where? do dot. Next. Dot. Uh, I don't think no. that is it. Next. I'm somewhere that is not really... Yeah. So, it's already in the bug report, so okay. this night there should be an IP build fixing that issue, which we ran into. That's great about Sharpfest, because yeah. um, basically we have the core developers here, and we're like, hey, this doesn't work. We need it, because people in the audience, they will look at us like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, Christian went to them like, nag, 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 this needs to work because it's important. They're like, what, what do we need it for? Um, very often they're, they're writing stuff that they think is useful, but if you're an analyst and you have something that doesn't work, just let them know why it's important for you that it works. And when is it coming out? This night. This night. The, the nightly build of this night will have it fixed. All right? Should. Should. <laughs> Let's see about that. <laughs> we have a core developer here and he says it's fixed, so it should be. Well, should we trust this guy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Chris, he's good. Yeah. So unfortunately, we either have to scroll or we can use a quick filter and see if that turns out. What? Really? Filter? No, yeah, just go, jump to it. Uh. Go to the response, check the get. You'll be fine. Or just jump to your mark. I think you marked the frame. Yeah, I go to the mark, but I keep forgetting what the shortcut is to go. That's yeah, also in the go menu. Previous mark. Oh, there. No, I want to go to the next mark, right? No. Much more useful. So that that's is also why marking is useful. Because right now, losing track, finding it back, getting distracted. Oh, where was I? Okay, I got a mark. That's good. It's good to have. All right, so what do you think? Does it have some kind of connection, the yellow and the green one? Yeah. It ends right before we have the slow response, right? So we think this is it. You sure? Not 100%, but from experience, probably close enough, right? I mean, you should, you should double check with the timing. There's two 200 OKs, they're right, right apart from each other, there's no big delay in there. So, well, let's just think. I might be OK, but let's filter to be sure. You want to filter on what? On both conversations. Both conversations? Yeah, sure. Okay, how do you filter on two conversations at the same time? Uh, I'll go for stream index. Yeah, stream index is a good idea. Sure let's, work. Let's do that. So what is my stream index here? It's That's IP. I know. I'm old. Yeah, sorry. Give me some time. I want to have a coffee. Yeah, you want your break, I know. Yeah. 95 and 93. We'll fix the resolution during the break so you can see the start of a filter as just two TCP stream things or so we'll either get both TCP streams out there. This is how it looks like. Yeah. TCP stream equals 93 or 95. Let's go. go. Zoom out. This is also why colorizing gives you a pretty decent chance to just follow stuff. So you see, this is connection number one, there's a few packets of connection number two, and you can see all the interactions when two sessions are depending on each other. So if you didn't do it before, try playing around with this colorizing option, it really gives you a nice, nice sense of it. You don't have to check for the port numbers all the time and do other stuff. All right. Break. Any questions up to here? So what do we confirm? We confirmed the client is having a problem. It's not the user being pretty picky on the response side because over seven seconds definitely seems to be a problem. Seven seconds definitely is an issue. Uh, can we already tell if the proxy might be affected by this? Is the proxy doing something fishy why it takes so long? No, because of what? Because we see on Jasper's side the proxy is on its own requesting for the client to another system and the 200 OK from the other systems comes back in like also seven seconds later 
So the proxy is also just waiting for the response. He can't do any faster. So we can put the proxy of the hook and say, okay, at least for this specific thing, the proxy doesn't do anything bad or anything slow. So after the break, next step, what do we do? Closer to server. We go to the next guy. So whatever the proxy is asking, and we can tell you it's the load balancer. So the proxy is going to the load balancer right on the ingress of the data center and ask the load balancer to do his job and to get this data out to the proxy. So the next guy in question will be the load balancer and we're going to reproduce that and then go even further to the data center. Before we go, yeah. can you just see if the piece statistics flow graph still works? The what? If you go to statistics, uh, there should be a flow graph there. And let's see if it maps it. There you go. Sock you. 